Great. So first, I um, want to thank everybody for being here, and I especially want to thank everybody for having me here. It's always great to come to, to Switzerland and give a talk. So keep a round of applause for putting on such an awesome con. It's really great. I'll tell you, putting on a con is not an easy task, and how well run this is is amazing. Um, you know, we run uh, DerbyCon and a few other ones, and uh, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of work. So, I mean, seriously, kudos to everybody that made this happen. It's uh, it's been really smooth, really awesome. The, the talks have been great, the speakers, I mean, everything. So, uh, you know, again, a shout out to everybody that made it possible here. Uh, just a couple quick slides on on myself. Um, I've got to do some fun things, um, everything from being on the news to kind of owning everything that I like to touch. Um, and uh, so that was in front of Congress. I got yelled at a whole bunch of times by the Democratic Party. They don't like me at all. Um, I'm also a nerd. I'm a Doctor Who fan. I like hugging and cuddling. And uh, that was in Paris and a few other places. Uh, I was a Marine. Uh, I like to blow stuff up. Lots of things, lots of guns. And I'm also one of the sexiest uh, men alive, apparently. That is not photoshopped. That is 100% what was on TV. Now, the funny part about this is that um, when, when I was on TV, I was on the, in the United States, it's called the Katie Kirk Show. And uh, I, um, it's actually funny, maybe I can show it in a, a little bit later if I got time, but uh, I basically got done hacking into um, someone in the audience's computer and I enabled her webcam and I was looking at her daughter and stuff like that and, and all this other stuff. And, uh, there was an actor coming up next, and I don't know if you know the show Sherlock. Uh, there's a guy named Cumberpatch that's like the actor. And so it said, up next, one of the world's sexiest men alive. But then they removed the up next. You can kind of see the fade of it right there, and then it just left that with my picture up there. So I'm keeping it. I like it. I like to think I'm going <laughs> to. It's my title, sexy. And most importantly, I love hanging out with friends and meeting new people. So, you know, it's always great to talk and hang out with folks here. And last night, we had a great time in Switzerland. Um, so it's always great to, to get to see friends and hang out and party uh, because we don't get to do it a lot when we're always traveling a lot. So today, you know, the, this talk, you know, I look at, at education awareness programs in a lot of companies, and, and I think education awareness has been a really big focus for a number of organizations because it's really important. We see a lot of attacks happening through phishing or social engineering or whatever you, you want to call it, and, you know, the techniques that we use in the industry aren't the same of what we see in the wild. And what's interesting is our education awareness programs are based off of how we test as pen testers or as researchers or whatever. And so for me personally, we have to shift the dynamics of how we do things um, in pen testing and social engineering and everything else to emulate what we see out there in the wild or what's going to be coming up later on. And, you know, I've been doing a lot of this stuff. You know, uh, it was funny. When, when I first got into um, the security industry, I worked for um, the Marine Corps and the intelligence side. And I got out, and social engineering wasn't really a big thing. You know, no one was really doing it as far as their, part of their pen tests, or you know, companies weren't focusing on education awareness. There wasn't a huge threat around teaching users around security. And we've really changed a lot, which is a great thing. But we really have to focus on making it the right type of research, the right type of education, because without that, we're going to get owned for a long time. And there's no way to stop everything. There's no question about that. But we can definitely do things that at least detect certain things, much like we would do on the network side. And so today I'm going to be you know, showing you kind of what we do for education awareness, what we're taught for education awareness, um, what we do as pen testers, and then kind of blowing all of that out of the water. And I'm going to show you some, some cool uh, techniques in the new version of, of the Social Engineer Toolkit. I actually just released uh, version 6.02 uh, yesterday. It was funny, um, Ubix was giving us talk on, um, on how to protect against job apps. Does anybody, did anybody see that one? Yeah, a few people, great. So in the middle of his presentation, one of his defensive mechanisms was to um, um, remove the header or the user agent string. If you see a user agent string in Java, deny it. So I rewrote the Java applet so now the user agent string now emulates Internet Explorer. So the Java applet now calls out via Internet Explorer and now you, you know, got around it. So then I released a new version 6.02 yesterday. During, during the talk, by the way, it was pretty cool. So, fun times. So here's how we hack today. Now starting off, um, again, I'm going to walk through what we're, talk, uh, what we, we're taught. We're going to walk through what really works, and then we're just going to mess some stuff up. I'm going to kind of throw out a lot of misconceptions that we use. Like, for example, one of my favorite ones to do um, isn't necessarily exploitation. If you look at, you know, I guess the latest and greatest sexy exploit, and it's very difficult to fire off an exploit on an organization. Like, for example, if I'm going to compromise them with like an IE zero day, I need to do a lot of research and homework beforehand to make sure I understand what version they have. Do they have things like Emmet installed, or what type of protection mechanisms do they have in place? And in, in most organizations, has everybody here had the same exact version of IE across your entire organization? No, right? So you're limited on, on your attack surface and what you're actually going to go after. And so for me personally, I don't ever really rely off of exploits anymore to compromise an organization. 
I, I use methods that, that are legitimate, that I know if they have certain things installed, um, I can take advantage of that without actually triggering something like a zero day or an exploit. And to be honest with you, you know, in the real world scenarios, the chances of you getting burned by a zero day are very small. You know, most people don't want to burn a zero day on you because of what you have. So we'll talk about different techniques that you can use to defeat a lot of the stuff that's out there today. We're going we're to get around things like application whitelisting. We're going to get around next generation firewalls. We're going to get around um, obviously antivirus, but that's kind of a joke in itself, right? Um, we'll get around anything that you can possibly imagine. Uh, we'll get around Emmet. We'll get around everything um, in, these, in, in this talk, which would be cool. And additionally, my favorite one that we're taught, which is the hover, right? So we're all taught that you know, if you get an email or you get a website or whatever, hover over the link to make sure that it's legit. If you hover over the link, it's good, right? Well, we're going to defeat the hover today, too. So we're going to get around the hovering um, and actually you know, compromise people with a legitimate link that looks legitimate, but it's really going to a bad site. So if you look at today's phishing, we send hundreds of emails or whatever. Sometimes it's got misspellings. We're really sensitive because we don't want to, to, to um, you know, impact emotions inside of people's uh, organizations. And we train people on, on, on who clicks stuff. So if you click something, you might go to like a, a website that says, hey, you probably shouldn't have clicked that. Here's a nice video on, on things that you should look for as an indicator, right? That's kind of our education awareness today. And what's interesting about this concept here is you know, this is pretty much universal across the board, regardless of what country you're in or wherever. I mean, this is kind of what our de facto, you know, education awareness is. And if we go with things like, you know, um, companies that provide services of phishing and, you know, education awareness, this is pretty much what you get. And what's interesting, you know, when we do um, social engineers or spear fishes for an organization, especially the first time, I warn them, I'm like, listen, our fish is going to piss people off. People are going to be really hurt and upset, and they're going to be yelling and screaming, but you need to understand that this is for the right purpose. And after you do this one and you go through all this shit, after that it's going to get a lot easier for you to do it over and over and over again. So let your key people know, like VPs and stuff like that, because those are the ones that usually throw a big, big hissy fit, especially if you're like impersonating HR and stuff like that. Um, but really, you know, it, it's, it's for the better. Now, this is today, right? Real world, if I'm going to go after a company, I'm only going to target a few people, like two or three max. So if I'm going to do a fish, I'm only going to send it to like two or three people that I, I know have a high confidence level that they will click on something. Like I'll target folks that aren't necessarily technical savvy. I won't go after IT people, right? I'll go after, um, you know, folks in sales or human resources. Uh, one of my favorite ones that I did a while ago, um, so I went on, the, on this company's website and uh, and started looking at their press releases. And I noticed they had a point of contact person that was their uh, um, coordinator for all of their communications for media and things like that. And they just released a, a, a big post that basically said, you know, hey, we, we're celebrating 100 years um, as being an American-based company, you know, billions of dollars of revenue, we've grown so much, we're so excited about this. So I'm, I took all that information that was from their press release, I'm like, I'm just going to build a fish off of this, right? And so the first thing I did is I, just, I, I registered a domain name that was like from like, you know, newsmedia.com or something like that, and I sent her an email, and I'm like, hey, I just want to let you know, um, you know, we want to do a story on this, and I think, you know, you know, I think you guys are really awesome, it's a good testament to having a U.S.-based company, you know, all this other stuff. And so I sent her an email, and she immediately responds back to me. Now, what does that one email tell me? Don't think technical, by the way, not technical at all. What does one, one email from a person inside of a company tell me? Well, who's addressed to? So that person, now I have that person's info, but most importantly, the template of their email, right? So now I know that their, you know, their name, their title, the colors that they use, the phone number schemes, everything, right? Just that right there alone is everything that I need to start building something. So then from there, I built a fish that basically sent a, a pr the press release that was in their format, exact format, and it was a PDF attached. Did that PDF have an exploit on it? No, no need to. You, by doing that, you can do whatever you want to. So you, you basically have the, the right to do anything at that point because it looks legitimate. So I sent an email to three people, and that was it, three. And it was a stupid fish. It was like, they didn't want to do like some crazy sophisticated one because they were worried about um, making people mad. So it was a, um, it was a celebration of the 100 years of, of being in this organization, and 100 years of, of testament to our employees and everything else. So we're the first 100 people get a free iPhone. The latest and greatest at the time was the 4S, right? And so when they, when, they, when they got this email, I only sent it to three people. I had like 300 people respond to it because people were forwarding it to each other inside the bank or inside the, the company to get it to come back to them. I'm like, this is sweet. So I had like shells raining and coming back to me and everything. And I actually had people that were like, and after a while they decided to block it and everything. And, and, and we, we moved our shells off to other systems so we still had access to their infrastructure. And the best part was, like, the lady's like, this lady emails us at the, the email address that we sent the email out to, and she's like, hey, um, our IT people blocked it. It says it's a security threat. How can I get around this? And I'm like, oh, it's, I'm like, just go to this new site we created. And she's like, oh, you guys are so helpful. Thank you so much. And we got her, too. And um, one of the worst ones about this was uh, I got an email from a lady that was like, I just love this company. 
She's like, my daughter is so sick right now, and we can't afford to get her an iPhone, and this is going to make her life, you know, because she's, you know, got cancer and all this other stuff. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like the worst person ever in this world. So I went and bought her an iPhone anyway, like the only person I bought an iPhone for. Um, but, you know, you just got you to you gotta test those things out, and it's just simple stuff that you can do as long as it's believable. But, again, only targeting a couple of people, right, only in customizing it for that organization. When you look at a company, they bleed information. Like, you could just go to LinkedIn, and it tells you everything about their company, like, hey, we just implemented ArcSight, or hey, we just implemented this, you know, this specific piece of technology, or we have this type of antivirus, or we do this, or we do this. I mean, they give you everything about their organization because we all love bragging about ourselves. Like, LinkedIn's my favorite. I can map out your entire perimeter, like how mature your, your, your monitoring and detection program is, or who you use for your MSSP. All of that stuff is things that I need to know before I actually attack you, and we profile out when you do it. And that's what you need to focus on um, in, in real fishing. We're, we'll show some examples of it. So we look at today's training that we go through. Um, so typically we have like online CBT type training. Um, it's boring as hell. Like I, I was a, a chief security officer for a uh, Fortune 1000 company in the United States. And you know, I click through the CBT stuff. I'm like next, 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 finish. And I was in charge of security. There's no way I'm going through that, that stuff. It's terrible. Maybe a one day training session if, you, if you're lucky. Um, like if you have like an in-person session that you do training around. Uh, maybe use a third party to fish you, whatever. But that's kind of what we do for training um, for our users, you know, when it comes to online training type stuff. Real world training, you know, if you look at um, education awareness, you actually have to test your users. You actually have to go out and say, listen, we're going to attempt to go after you. Now, you're not going to tell them that until after. And you go after them, and you, try, and you train them all year long. You have to make it fun, too. Um, like, I, I like to do a lot of things with training uh, when I was at, at, uh, at Diebold where we'd actually like have cool people come and speak, we'd have like giveaways, raffles, and we'd relate it to people. And one of my favorite ones was uh, you know, like how to protect yourself at Facebook, and how to protect your home wireless, and how to protect your kids. When people can relate to that at their home, they start to do it on the corporate side. And let's not, let's not kid ourselves, nobody inside of an organization, if you're not in security, cares about their company's data. They just don't care. Like there was, a, there was one fish that we did, um, and we targeted a sales guy. And the sales guy was like, I'm like, hey, man, can you go and download this file? He's like, yeah, sure. He's like, I'm getting a virus warning. I'm like, oh, just right-click on virus and hit stop and exit. He's like, okay, cool. He, he stops and exits. And he runs in. I get access. And I'm like, hey, can you do me a couple things? Can you just type in CMD, type ipconfig, and da-da-da-da? And he's doing this all for me, right? Because he wants to sale. They don't care about what you're actually doing. Um, and so we have to make them realize that. Uh, my favorite today is, like, equipment drops. We're still doing USB drops. Like, Really? That's like the most ridiculous thing. That's like 1984 shit. Like, I mean, I don't know if USBs were out then, but something like that, right? Around that time. But, I mean, Auto Run's already disabled anyway, all right, in most cases, in most organizations. I mean, does this even still work? I don't understand the USB drops. Personally, what I love doing is when you actually go after a company, use the mail system. Because in the mail system, you can be anybody you want to. You can be an executive in that company. You can be whomever. And you write a nice little letterhead with their company name on it or whoever you're impersonating and have them do, like, step by step tell them what to do. They will do whatever you want to because you can be anybody you want to in a handwritten letter or, you know, a letterhead or whatever that you send to them in the mail. So send them something in the mail and all of a sudden they get it and you just sit there and have the shelves waiting and they'll do everything for you. Like, hey, you need to go and update this and you got to go download this file, double click it and run, hit, hit accept, okay, good, done, you know? You can do whatever you want in the mail. Like, there was one time uh, where we modified a keyboard um, with the Tinsy in it, okay? And so if you don't know what Tinsy, it's Adreno-based, it's tiny. And we, we opened up the back of this keyboard, and uh, we soldered the Tinsy device onto it, and we did an inline uh, um, um, sniffer, too, so we can you know, capture keystrokes and all that, which has been done. But what was awesome is when they uh, we, we sent a letterhead from the company saying, as part of our refresh program, this is now your new keyboard. Plug it in and, and use it and everything else. And so what we did is we waited for the control delete sequence, and then we captured the username and password, okay? And then it would wait like, until um, there was no key sequences typed on the keyboard, for about eight hours. And what does that mean? They've gone home or something, right? They're in meetings, they're gone home. And when we detected that, it would, it would jig, uh, jiggle the mouse, because the keyboard you can emulate any hidden. And um, so it would wiggle the mouse so the screen would come on, and it would type control to delete, it would log in with the username and password, and then it would drop a uh, payload onto the system and compromise the machine. So you can do whatever you want to. People will do anything you want to in the mail. It's awesome. Why even drop a USB hid device anywhere? If someone's still picking up USB devices and plugging them in and double clicking on EXEs, you got problems. Like 1990s problems. Um, SD in person, these are my, my favorite, right? So SD is in person, impersonating delivering people, impersonating employees, piggybacking. I mean, we, we start to get so sophisticated like we're James Bond. Like, you know, you know, busting into buildings, evading security systems, when all you need to do is just walk through the front door and act like you own the place and do whatever you want to, right? 
So this is some of the key common steps we do today. Real world, make it easy, simple. You know, don't do anything crazy. Um, really, you really need to use things like prox marks or bust in the buildings. Just as an example, I was doing a, um, a physical for a, uh, um, a store, store location for a big retailer chain in the United States. And literally, so some of my bogeys or trophies to get for the organization was to steal uh, one of their point of sale systems. You know, so they have a point, you know, the, the point of sale reader and then the point of sale system and everything. And so they're like, well, how are you gonna do it? I'm like, I don't know, I'll, I'll figure it out. And so when I first started, I started really sophisticated. Like I, I spoofed my phone number coming from, you know, this corporate headquarters and I called in, I said, hey, I have two technicians coming in, make sure you grab their card and everything. We, we made, you know, um, shirts that look like we're from the corporate headquarters and everything. Really sophisticated, right? Didn't need to do any of that. So we had, we, had, we had 17 store locations we had to test, so this one worked you know, just fine. Literally the second store, I walked into the store, like just dressed like this, walk into the store, I walked up to the register, and I took the whole thing and I walked out of the building. That was it. No one said anything, no one stopped me, I just, and they had the cash in it and everything. There was like, you know, like two grand in cash in it. I wasn't supposed to take that, but I thought it'd be cool, right? So I'm like, hey, have a good, have a good day. This thing was heavy too, I mean it was like, it was probably like 80 pounds, so I'm like, Walk out of the store, it's cool, no problem. Don't have to do anything crazy sophisticated. So here's what we teach our users, right? Um, on the phone, don't provide sensitive information, caller ID checks, suspicious activity, et cetera, et cetera. What's great is you can be anybody. I mean, phone spoofing is obviously very easy. My six-year-old can do it. Um, you can be anybody in the company. One thing you have to be aware of, though, is if you're impersonating somebody inside the company, don't call their best friend. One day uh, we were doing a, a fish and we spoofed our phone number and said, hey, we have two contractors coming in. One of the bog uh, bogus was the data center. And so, we, you know, I'm like, hey, just, can you let these two guys into the data center, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, who'd you, who'd you say you were? I'm like, oh, this is Paul. He's like, no, Paul and I are best friends and he's like down the hall from me. I'm like, ee, click. You know, so you got to be careful who you impersonate. But if you do your, your pretext right, especially you could be anybody you want to on the phone. It's great. Easy stuff. Not sophisticated. Now email is my favorite, right? Users are taught the hover, which is my favorite one out of them all because the hover is like everything that is sacred in an organization. When I say hover, when you hover over a link, it's gotta be legit, right? If you see that, that I hover over this link and it's going to gmail.com or whatever, right? It's legit, right? You're good. That's what we're taught, right? Can you defeat that? Well, you, you're saying yes now, but you didn't know before I was talking. But uh, I mean, you know, check the domain name, look for suspicious activity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna talk about um, set version 6.02 and then we're gonna play a little game, okay? And, and um, this game is gonna be something where I'm gonna show you two scenarios of attack and then you're gonna tell me how to defend against it. And so with the, with the new version of set 6.02, listen, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff in set and I can't cover it all, but there's some really cool stuff that was just added in 6.02 that I'm really proud of. Um, but really, you know, set's designed, if you haven't used it, to perform any type of, of phishing. The new um, attack vectors in there really provide a high level of success, um, and it's really to test the effectiveness of your program, which is exactly what we're talking about here. And so that's, that's the uh, code I, I wrote um, during Mubix talk and pushed out that uh, does the new user agent string. And warning, one thing I, I was, um, I'm cautious of is, listen, set's just a tool. The, how you actually look at an organization, how you actually profile an organization, what you actually build, is what's gonna make it successful. Just using the stuff out of set I don't recommend. Build your stuff and do it the right way because without it, it's just a tool. And if you're just using a tool, you're a tool, right? So you gotta do proper OSINT, recon, homework, research your target, know your target, um, develop your attacks and based on what you're going after. I mean, that's what I do, you, that's what you have to do. You have to build a fantasy. My whole goal with social engineering is to make you believe something that's completely bullshit, right? It has no relevance whatsoever, it's completely fake, but they have to believe it. So if you make something a little bit right, you're good. So let's do a demo. All right, can everybody see this okay? Screen? Good? So this attack was originally um, uh, committed uh, by a guy named uh, Emgent and White Sheep uh, who did this um, attack and it's called a webjacking attack. Now the new version of set 6.0, um, 6.0 when it was released, takes it to kind of like a whole new level. It's friggin' amazing, right? And um, I still have to give credit to Emjit and White Sheep for, for putting this in there, it's, it's really slick. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the social engineer um, attack menu, which is number one, and we're gonna go to the website attack vectors, which is number two, okay? Now number two, we're gonna select um, the webjacking method, which is number five. 
And then we're gonna clone a site. And what set will do is it'll clone any website you want to, okay? So whether it's trustedsec.com or Gmail or whatever company you're targeting, you can clone any site you want to. Also, you can import your own. So if you make your own fake website or whatever, you can import that as well. We'll just do a site cloner. And then we're gonna do, I, I gotta uh, type my IP address in. Now, what I recommend in this attack, and what you're gonna see is just a really simple example. When I build this out, I make it look legitimate in every way, right? And I'll register a domain name that's very similar to it, and I'll explain that in a second. We're gonna defeat that, but we still want to make the user interaction process as, as less suspicious as possible. So normally I'll register a domain name for, for demonstration purposes, I'm not going to. And then we'll just clone Gmail. Now, the reason I do Gmail is just because it's a form, it has forms on it. So you can do whatever has a username and password prompt. A lot of times, great ones are like VPNs or Exchange or anything that's outward facing. I like benefits web pages for, for customers. Um, and what's great too is like, when you send this fish out, you can be like telling them specific instructions, like make sure you hover over this link to make sure it's legit. Make sure you do this and make sure you do this. And, and by the way, make sure you use your username and password that you log into your Windows machine with. Great. It's, you give them the instructions that everything they need to do. Make it easy for them. Because they're, they're not gonna know. So this is just a, a simple login field here. And it's gonna clone the website. And then it moves everything to um, Apache, so under var www. Now, what I would do at this point, once I cloned it, is that the website you're gonna see here in just a second is really simple, right? So let's just go, this, let's go to this really quick. All right, that's not right. Who's messing with me? No, I'm just kidding. Let me clear my cache real quick. That's just cache stuff. Oh, actually, I know what that is. Okay, that should be good. All right. There. So now notice this is a very basic site, okay? What I would do is this is a very simple HTML file. Make it look believable in every way, shape, or form, okay? Make it look like a legitimate site. Make it look good. And in here, say, make sure that you're going to a trusted sec location, or making sure you're going to this location when you hover over this link. Because we wanna make sure that you don't get fished, right? This could be a phishing scheme, or you know, fishers like to use this technique, so make sure you hover over the link, and make sure you validate what URL you're going to, all right? Now again, this would look, look nice and pretty for whatever you're doing. Um, again, benefits for me is a, a great one, like going after benefits websites, things like that in the United States. Um, those are common ones that I use, or any type of externally facing portal. Now look what happens when I hover over this. What does it say down there in the bottom left? Can you see it? It's a little bit uh, big, but can you see that? Everybody see that? It's https colon forward forward slash accounts.google.com. Is that legit? Is there, would everybody before I started talking think that's legit? Yeah? So again, accounts.google.com, right? So it's legit, right? So if we click on this, we should go to accounts.google.com, right? So when I click on this link, I want you to watch what happens really quick on the URL bar. There's gonna be, there's gonna be another tab opened, and you're actually gonna be at accounts.google.com, all right? Your machine is actually gonna contact the accounts.google.com server, but then I'm gonna do a quick switcheroo, all right, without any user interaction, you ready? So I click it, no magic, I'm at accounts.google.com, quick switcheroo, type in my username, Enter a username and password in. I'm redirected back to the legitimate site. And over here, we got the username and password. Can't even tell, can you? Pretty messed up. That one's a little dirty. I feel bad about that, actually. <laughs> so that's defeating the hover. The next one we're gonna see is the Java applet attack. And that's kinda like the flagship attack vector in set. Now, the reason I like showing the Java applet attack is because it doesn't take advantage of any type of exploit. It doesn't use any specific exploit in Java or anything else to take advantage of it. The great thing about applets, once they run, is they run unrestricted. There's no sandbox you have to break out of. There's nothing you actually have to exploit. You're literally running it with full access on the computer. Now the new version of set actually has predictive analysis to see what the best method of exploitation is. So if you're running Windows 7 or Windows Vista and above, it does probability ratios to say, listen, the best route of, of attack based on what you have installed is this method, and I'm gonna use that as my method for exploitation. 
So it's going to start off with things like PowerShell or Excel backdoors or um, using you know, WScript or whatever. There's multiple exploitation methods that it tries. If it sees that it's Windows XP, it's going to try Windows XP exploitation methods. First, it's going to identify PowerShells in, um, on the machine, then do PowerShell injection. And my favorite attack in all of this is that um, a guy named Matthew Graber, who's a phenomenal PowerShell guy, came out with an ability to inject um, alphanumeric shell code straight into memory. So you have the ability through PowerShell natively to inject into uh, memory completely transparent without touching disk, which is really important, especially if you're going after things like application whitelisting or any sort of memory analysis stuff. It's great for it. And what's great about this is I did a talk at DEF CON like 17 or something like that when PowerShell beta came out. And it was one of the first talks on PowerShell. And we figured out how to get around what are called execution restriction policies. So there's, I think there's four different execution restriction policies. You have like all signed, signed, um, remote and unrestricted or something like that, or restricted and unrestricted. And um, even with the most restrictive um, execution restriction policy, you can still execute PowerShell on the machine and, and bypass execution restriction policies. So what happens in, in the Java app when you hit run is it actually compromises it purely in memory. So there's no touching of the disk, there's no malware droppers or anything like that. And then it also um, does encryption. So it actually puts an AES-256 bubble in memory around your shellcode. So when it pipes out, it's coming back in, in an encrypted format, which is really nice. So we'll go to number one. We're going to go to the website attack vector number two. And we're going to go to the Java Apple attack number one. And then we're going to site clone number two. And it's asking for using NAT or port forwarding. I'm going to hit no. Type in my IP address real quick. And I'm going to use my own Java applet, which is number two. Now, with Java 7 update 42, I believe, they removed the ability to use self-signed uh, ja uh, Java applets. And the reason for that is because they're inherently insecure. And it's been a whole progression. It's taken them like seven years to do this. Um, but what's great is that you can literally do um, register, at least in the United States, you can register what's called a, a DBA or doing business as, which is like 30 bucks. And then you just go buy a code signing cert. So I have like DBAs of like verified publisher. This, this is a legitimate app applet. You know, this is secure, please trust it. You can do di doing business as whatever you want to. And then you just buy a code signing cert and it's legit. This is what everybody in the wild is doing. So just spend a couple bucks, go get a code signing cert, and then boom, you have a really believable um, fish that will work on any platform. What's great about this um, technique too is, again, it doesn't run an exploit, but it gets around pretty much every preventive measure that I know of. It gets around next generation firewalls, it gets around um, application whitelisting, it gets around antivirus, it gets around you know, everything else you can possibly imagine. I don't know if there's any other technology. DLP, what are those words? APT prevention, I can't remember all of them. But um, it gets around all of them, which is awesome. So you have a high probability of success. So we're going to do use the app at number two. And we're going to clone just trustedsec.com as an example. So it's going to clone it. And then here we have um, payload options. Now, the payload options are kind of interesting. These will only trigger and fire um, if the other exploitation methods fail, like PowerShell injection, Excel injection, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it'll, it'll fall back to this as, as a very last mechanism um, if there's a binary. And these are all AV safe and all that good stuff, so you don't have to worry about them getting picked up. And my favorite to use is what we call multi pi injector, which is number 16. And with multi pi injector, what you can do is when you're going you're to compromise an organization, you don't know, um, unless you've already done your recon, what ports they allow outbound, right? So egress filtering. So with multi-pi injection, you can have it spray multiple ports. And you only want to do a few. You don't want to be too loud. But you can have it try 21, 22, 53, 25, you know, 80, 4, 4, 3, and see which ones go out. And you can also use Metasploit's HTTP and HTTPS payloads so that they're proxy aware, which is great. So you can use multi-pi injector to spray out multiple ports and, and when you get a, um, a route home. And additionally, when you use multi-pi injector, it automatically configures the PowerShell injection the same way. So when you exploit an individual machine, it's going to use the same type of, of shell code to spray out multiple ports via PowerShell, and if that works, then it's not going to execute the binaries. Um, additionally, uh, with, with, with these, these, these actual binaries that get dropped are nothing. So if you double click them, it does nothing. You inspect it, like IE uh, via FireEye or something like that, it doesn't do anything. It's nothing. It's just a binary that does nothing. It just runs in and exits. However, if you provide a AES-256 encrypted block with a dynamic cipher key, which gets generated every single time and set, It'll then decrypt all of that shellcode and run the shellcode for you. So you get around things like FireEye and stuff like that as well with it, which is beautiful. <clears throat> so I'll do number 15. And then I'll just use an a interpreter payload, just as an example. <clears throat> and I dynamically patch the shellcode real time, so it's not actually generating Metasploit shellcode every time. So I have all the shellcode, and I just dynamically patch it with your IP address and port automatically for you so it's faster. And then it's going to launch Metasploit. <clears throat> And 
And over here, we're going to go to our website. You notice it looks just like Trusted Tech in every way, shape, or form, right? Looks good. And the name field, you can make it whatever you want to. Obviously, I like goats, um, so I made my goats. Um, but you can name the name field whatever you want to. So you can have it be the company name, et cetera, et cetera. The publisher is what you don't have control over. So that's where you would register a doing business as and then buy a code signing cert for whatever you're targeting. So to get a doing business as and a code signing cert takes about two days, all right? Because you have to register the doing business as, that takes a day. And then to, to get a verification call of, that you're doing, doing business as from the phone number that's registered to takes about a day as well. So you can have a code signing cert in two days. Um, and then that publisher could be anything you want. So like I said, I own like verified publisher, uh, trusted publisher, this, this applet is secure, whatever you want. You can doing business as whatever the hell you want to. It doesn't make a difference. It's great. <clears throat> then you hit run. And then what happens is it redirects you back to the legitimate site so that the um, victim doesn't know that they were at a malicious site in the first place. So now you're back at the legitimate site. And you go back over here. And you notice we have two shells. Now, the reason I did two shells is I, um, there's a fallback option in set that'll, that'll say, listen, still run the payloads and make sure you have reliable exploitation in case something goes wrong. So a lot of times I like to pipe out two shells instead of one just to make sure, because sometimes you get weird issues with uh, communication and transport. And you see here we have our interpreter shells. So we have access to the computer through that. And we didn't run an exploit, no exploit. So boom, there we go, right? Good stuff, easy. And you know, and see how fast that was to set up? It just takes a couple minutes, right? As long as you did the recon ahead of time to find out what you're actually targeting and made a good enough pretext, like, tell them about the applet. Say, listen, in order to verify that you're a company-owned asset or computer, you need to run the applet that says, you know, co company name security check. Cool, they'll hit run. Build that stuff into your pretext. They will do anything you want them to. Where'd my mouse go? Here we go. Okay. So we're going to play a game, okay? I mean, it requires audience interaction. I'm going to give you a list of multiple choice, and we're going to talk about how to fix these issues because there are ways of stopping these type of attacks. So I'm going to give you multiple choice, so A, B, C, and D. You tell me which one it's going to be that's going to be the best solution. You can pick multiple ones too, okay? So for the Java applet attack specifically, that was the one you just saw now, what's the, what's the easiest way of, of getting rid of it? <laughs> All of the above. Very good, sir. Very good. Yes, sir. That is correct. No, for real, though. Um, <laughs> sorry, we had a good time last night. Um, <laughs> I still crack up every time I see that picture. I'm sorry. Um, so A, B, C, or D? A, B, C, or D? All of the above. Very good, yes. So all of the above on this, all right? So A, disallow execution from temp, that'll stop um, most malware, right? Most malware executes from temp. It also stops Java updates, by the way, because um, Java requires a temp directory to run. Again, ho most horrible thing ever. Um, B, disallow execution from all user profiles. Again, uh, common places for execution for malware. Now in set, that will stop the binary dropper piece because it uses temp the temp directory. Now if I see all of you fuckers using it, I'm going to change the directory so it'll be something different next time. But in the, right now, no one's ever stopping temp, so it'll be, it's great anyway. So right now, if you, if you block temp, you'll stop the binary dropping portion. Now, C, disallow regular users from execution of PowerShell. Um, in, in, uh, in Windows, in group policy, you actually have application whitelisting built into group policy. It's called App Locker. It's free. And App Locker, what you can do is you can say, I do not want regular users from running power, to run PowerShell, and you can disallow it. And you can do that all within group policy right now, which means that the PowerShell injection technique that you just saw doesn't work. Really simple thing, doesn't break anything. Do any of your users ever need to run PowerShell, normal users? No. So a really quick way of doing it. Um, remove Java or secure it if possible. Uh, one thing is um, you can actually strip applet tags. In fact, I think I talked about that. Yeah. So most proxies support um, what are called whitelisted sites, right? So you can disallow applets from running from, from, um, from actual HTML um, pages unless you whitelist them. So things like Cisco WebEx or things that you need to whitelist, just whitelist those and disallow applets from everything else. You can actually do rewrite rules too. So rewrite the Apple tags and just replace it with something else and the, the Apple will never execute. But you know, with that, nothing's bulletproof. I showed ways of bypassing um, execution restriction policies, um, circumvent AppLocker, um, and also run PowerShell code um, when AppLocker is being restricted. But again, it's like more of like a defense in depth strategy, right? Multiple layers of security 
to try to, try to protect against it. And to be honest with you, out of the box, you won't, it'll stop set, which is great. Um, this is a quick point, a proof of concept that I think it's kind of hard to see, but this is a proof of concept that I got around um, AppLocker with. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite ones. It's called the Magic Unicorn Attack. Uh, it's, it's a free tool. It's open source on GitHub. And what's nice about this is it'll actually generate um, the PowerShell execution stuff for you. So just a quick example, just to show you. So this is pretty sexy. So if I run uni uh, unicorn up UI, this is off. Oh, hang on, I gotta get the unicorn. Dang it. There we go. No, there we go. I'm having some major typing problems today. Man, okay, that's never happened before. Um, if you run Unicorn, you specify what payload you want to, it'll automatically generate the, um, the, the shell code for you, and then it'll pipe you a shell back on this port and this, um, this, this IP and this port. And what's great about this is literally it gives you the copy and paste string. So, you, so let's just say you have uh, a shell somewhere. Like uh, for a lot, a lot of times I like using PS exec commands, and I'll put this into here, and I'll paste PS exec commands and Metasploit into it, and it runs PowerShell on all the systems for you and gets you shells without touching disk. And so literally, if I just run this command right here, and my IP, and do 443, it'll automatically generate the shellcode for me. It'll export that, and it creates an RC file for Metasploit for you. So if I just run the Metasploit, MSF console dash r unicorn dot rc, that'll load. And at the same time, let me copy and paste my shellcode here. So here we have our shellcode. Um, it's, it's encoded to get around the execution restriction policies. And you see here, that's just the command right there. It's just a command that you paste into a command prompt or whatever you have access to if you have remote code execution. And you just highlight this, and literally you just paste it in. So if I paste it into here, this is an example. Obviously, in an exploitation scenario, you might not have a shell. You just paste that in the command prompt, you hit enter. That's not supposed to happen. Oh, something, something happened here, hang on. Let me just highlight that all. There we go. There it goes. I didn't copy and paste the whole thing. So if I go over to here, we get our shell. Again, not touching disk, anything else, purely memory resident. You're running under the process PowerShell, and you have access to the computer. Works great. Another fun trick that I like using, by the way, um, is what I call monitor. And if you look at a lot of the next generation firewalls, what they do is like next gen firewalls are literally like antivirus for the network. That's, that's it. They, they basically write signatures that they dub behavioral analysis and stuff like that. But if you make any changes or modifications to anything next generation, you're going to get around it, okay? And so what this is, is I went overkill. And I never have to use this because we're so shitty anyway in security that you don't ever have to worry about doing all this crazy stuff. Um, but in the event that we someday get good, I'll release this. Um, and what it does is it takes Meterpreter shoots it in the memory, encases it over an AES-256 bubble, tunnels it over SSH over HTTPS. And, it, and it's polymorphic, so every single get post response you're going to see is going to be completely dynamic every single time. Um, so you're going to see it basically tunnel. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it. So it's just waiting for first the initial um, uh, HTTPS connection. It's then going to uh, check to see if there's a specific unique code that gets generated. And then from there, it's going to then decrypt the SSH tunnel over local host and create a tap interface for us that we now have an interpreter shell, and it's all local on the, on the system itself. So we're waiting here for the encrypted shell. And I run this. So it's going to uh, do memory injection. It's going to inject into memory for you. It's going to encapsulate SSH over S uh, HTTP. Oh, I think I put that wrong IP address in. I don't have SSH running for the TAP interface. One second. Let me rerun it again. And over here, when it triggers, we should see it actually trigger down here in a second. See, encrypted tunnel identified, sending challenge to verify response, verified launching Metasploit. Right now, it created a TAMP interface um, over that H SSH tunnel over HTTPS. 
and then we should have our shell. And you're going to notice that it, the shell is actually going to be at 127.0.0.1 because we're tunneling it over localhost. There's our shell, 127.0.0.1, we're in. Hot stuff. And it's proxy aware too, which is great. Um, so expanding on that unicorn attack with the PowerShell injection, I recently just added in version uh, 6.0.1. Um, one of the most common techniques that we always get into are SQL servers. And for SQL servers, the most common technique is to, um, I did a uh, talk at DEF CON, like DEF CON 14 or something, on basically taking an executable, converting it to hexadecimal, and then basically pushing it through um, Microsoft SQL and then reconverting it back to a binary. Um, instead, what we use, I use the magic unicorn attack now uh, within Microsoft SQL. We can actually do direct PowerShell injection through Microsoft SQL and get a shell. Um, so that's in the new version 6.0.1. Um, so if you find uh, a SQL server, you can use PowerShell injection for it uh, to gain a shell through Microsoft SQL. So web jacking is a hard one. Uh, a, through, a through D, what do you think? What are the, the, the easiest ways to stop it? A, B, and C. So A, B, and C, education awareness, some technological controls, and sites that are uncategorized. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, here's some things to ponder when you're doing this. Um, education awareness is key. I mean, teaching people you know, certain things to look for. Um, this one's really tough because it looks believable. Um, Two-factor authentication is good. Now, my favorite one on two-factor authentication is when uh, you use something like phone factor. Phone factor is my favorite to own. Like if you have phone factor, I will own you every single time, period. There's no question about it. And the reason for that is because you've literally implemented two-factor authentication in the most horrendous way that you can possibly ever imagine because you put the error back onto the human. And so let me ask a question. Has anybody used phone factor before? Ever tried it out or anything? Um, there's a lot of them like this. What it'll do is when you log in with your username and password that I just fished or whatever, it has a prompt there and it says, I'm sending a verification text or calling you or whatever to verify who you are. What is that user going to do every single time? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm probably logging in somewhere right now. Yes. I've been on eight individual pen tests with Phone Factor. I have not once had an unsuccessful attempt. Everybody has always said, yes, that's me logging in. It's horrible. So you just put it back onto the user. So you got to make sure it's right, uh, too good, uh, um, too, a really good two-factor authentication. And then the uncategorized sites. Um, uncategorized sites are a, a feature that's are like, um, in things like ScanSafe, um, Blue coats, um, all of them have uncategorized site um, options. And those are where 90% of your fishes come from. People don't spend the time to actually register their names in like Blue Coat or um, you know, ScanSafe as a categorization site. So if you block those, you actually stop about 90% of the fishes. Now, a funny story about this one that Eric taught me was uh, um, if you can actually clone one of the major um, web content filtering's own websites, so like you can clone their own website and then submit it for approval and it actually puts you up as a content filtering software company. It's ridiculous. Um, least restrictive access, uh, Emmet's a good one. I think Rob talked a lot about that yesterday. Uh, Artillery is one of the tools that I wrote that's more on the defensive side of getting you more information. Just a quick Emmet breakdown. If you're not using it, really recommend it. Um, Emmet can easily be bypassed. It's very, very, very easy to bypass Emmet. Like literally the five controls you have in place requires me to do a call instead of a return. That's it. So if I'm using ROP, I'm going to do a call from a legitimate function or an API instead of doing a return on the stack. This is an example, though. Um, what was interesting about this zero day, it was an IE zero day, um, is it actually looked for the emmet.dll uh, file, and if it found it, it actually killed itself. It wouldn't run. So it's kind of neat. So there are some good, good stuff with emmet. I do recommend it, but again, it's really trivial uh, for, for us to be able to write something around it. Very trivial. So talking about fixing stuff, we have to stop the 1990s attacks, and we have to focus on continuing education that really works and it's entertaining. People are starting to believe in security now. It's weird, like when the Heartbleed stuff happened. Right? Or you see it on the news and other stuff. We're getting more buy-off than we ever have in the history of InfoSec. It's phenomenal. We have to capitalize on that and make sure people understand the ramifications and some of the ways that we get in. Um, we have to do things that relate to others, relate to people, because it personalizes it to them. You know, for, me, for me, when I was uh, in charge of a, the security program at a 30,000-employee you know, shop, um, the most important thing for me wasn't vulnerability management. It wasn't pen testing. It was education awareness. Like, if I could invest any money, period, in, a, in an organization, it wouldn't be on patch management. It wouldn't be, I mean, don't get me wrong, those are important things. It would be focusing on education awareness because that is, to me, one of the most critical pieces. Once I had an education awareness program, to implement something like NAC or something else it was trivial because people understood why I was doing it. I wasn't the bad security guy trying to ruin their lives with making things more restrictive. 
It was like, oh, hey, I remember them talking about this. They're really trying to protect us. That's cool. So it, it has multiple benefits aside from just what we're talking about here. So if you look at building out a program, you know, according to Bruce Schneider, I adamantly disagree with him on this one, but he doesn't believe in an education awareness program. He doesn't think it's effective. He thinks that uh, security should be through attrition and through what you do as far as your actions. I disagree. Um, the first thing is, you know, creating a group um, to sell to your executive committee. I mean, you get buy off on the top levels from there, you kind of build it out. Um, and then once you actually have a program, start building it out to actually do about, um, talk about security because no one right now cares about it. Um, when you build a program, they will come. I mean, I do a lot of fun stuff. Like we did podcasts at our company. Uh, we did quarterly newsletters uh, that were videos. And we did like fun skits and things like that to kind of keep it entertaining. Um, but you need to relate to information that's to employees. Like when Target happened, great example. Like, hey, there's been a big Target breach. You could be impacted. You know, you should do this. You should do this. You should do this. You're looking out for the people. Big difference. Um, and then last, you know, step three is really just testing the program. Actually going in and seeing what you're doing, how effective you are at actually stopping different types of attacks and where you need to improve on. It's like any other program that you have, you have to test it. Um, and then lastly, you know, definitely maintain uh, the program itself. Um, start to kind of build out everything that you need to. So I talked about this, I'll kind of skip through this part here because um, I'm running out of time. But uh, you know, next gen products to me are, are just a bunch of hogwash. Uh, it doesn't stop us as attackers. And my, my funny um, thing about uh, uh, next generation firewalls is, let me ask a question. Does anybody here have enough money for security, their security program? Does anybody have enough people for the security program? Didn't see any hands, okay? So let me ask a question. What happens when you bring a whole brand new piece of technology in and you slap it in, what happens? Do you introduce a whole new set of learning curves? Do you have to do a whole brand new set of complexity that you have to learn? Let me, let me just ask another question. So you had these guys that have been ASA engineers for 10 years, right? They're phenomenal at ASAs. And all of a sudden you put a next gen firewall in. What's gonna happen there? To learn a whole new piece of technology, seriously? Let me ask a question, is any of us do, doing network segmentation in our environments? Like, like HR can only talk to HR and their, their specific things, you know, compartmentalization. We're not even doing the basic stuff. We don't even know where our assets are at, let alone why we need a next gen firewall. We're well, ahead, uh, well below what we need to right now to even be thinking about this type of stuff. We need to focus on the basic things first. Um, some really cool stuff real quick. Um, so I like showing cool things, and I like, like when I get to build stuff, I don't, I'm not a big hardware guy, so I always mess it up horribly, so I have a funny story to show. Um, but basically, I built a new GPU cracker, and this is my fourth iteration of my GPU cracker that I built. And so I've gotten a lot better since the first uh, uh, rev, and so this is, the, this is the fourth one. So here's the second attempt that we built, and uh, that was actually really horrible. Um, and it's funny, because like, this heat sink here has like, a metal hook on it, and I actually sliced my finger, and it dripped blood all over the motherboard. So I took that back, and I had to explain, like, hey, this, it just came with blood on it. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Um, but you can see here, the, the way that the, the heat sinks are everything is just a bad design because it, it blows the air out in a pretty bad way. So we burned those cards out pretty quick. Third attempt was this one. Um, and so these were using the NVIDIA 290Xs. Um, so, you know, that was a, definitely a good one. And so our latest attempt, um, I wanted to go big or go home, right? And so those are uh, four R9 290Xs, uh, liquid cooled. And uh, we're getting about 90 billion passwords per second right now. Um, so we can crack like a nine character password in a few seconds, things like that. It works out really well. Um, so this is one of my favorite uh, ones to do. And what's funny about this one is uh, when I first got this, I f I f you know, we like to play jokes on each other and stuff like that. And uh, I, des I decided to make what's called a, a, a pee contest. So we couldn't pee until the whole thing was loaded with Ubuntu, okay? <laughs> and so we sat there. It took us 12 hours. 12 hours to get Ubuntu on this thing. So load up Ubuntu, black screen. Go in advanced mode, black screen. But we'll load anything, nothing, just dead, right? So I'm like, okay, I'll just go to a different version. Do a different version, same thing, black screen. Spent 12 hours trying to figure this out. By the way, we had to pee really bad. It was, we were like, listen, man, if we don't get this in like the next hour, we're literally gonna die. So it's probably a good idea that we just knock off the, we almost, we almost, we didn't. For some reason, I decided to put a DVD drive on this. There's no reason for me to put a DVD drive. I never use a DVD drive, but I thought it'd be cool to have a DVD drive on here. As soon as I unplugged it, it worked fine. 12 hours. Uh, some of the specs, we had you know, 32 gig Corsair Dominator. You don't really need a lot of RAM for this type of stuff. Um, Seagate 2 terabytes, uh, uh, Barracudas, Asus Rampage. Uh, the Asus Rampage is nice because it has four double wides, so you can fit um, you know, the GPUs in there. Um, and with the R9 uh, liquid cooled, I needed the space. Um, it's only 1500 watt uh, EVGA Supernova, which is nice. And so we're getting 90 points, uh, 3 billion uh, uh, passwords per second. That's NTLM. Cracks nine character passwords in less than 20 minutes, eight characters in two seconds. It's pretty sweet. 
I've actually shorted out. So we have a um, 20 amp circuit, and apparently that blows a 20 amp circuit. So be careful when you build these things because it blows a 20 amp circuit. Anybody have any questions? Well, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, you learned something new.